Now, the parable of the talents. Um, um, not too many people are familiar with this parable. You've heard, maybe you've heard it a little bit. But the, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 is sort of braided together with two other parables in Matthew 25 that, that are all about understanding what it means to be a faithful servant uh, while we await Christ's return to the earth. Now, last week we looked at the weeds and the, the wheat. The weed representing the good seed that was sown and the weeds representing a bad seed that was thrown and that in this life, the good seed, the wheat, and the weeds grow together. We cohabitate together. That In this world, we see evil and we see good. And at the end, when Jesus returns, he's going to have his angels separate the wheat from the weeds. And, and so this parable this morning, the parable of the talents, is how do we live our lives in the meantime, between that time uh, uh, where, where Jesus returns again? What does it look like to be faithful in this time, in this place where the wheat and the weeds cohabitate together. And that the three parables in Matthew 25 sort of focus on specific details of what that looks like. Now, in this parable, we're, we're looking at the, the, that there's this, um, that in this in-between time, as we await Christ's return, um, what does it mean to be faithful in our actions? What does it mean to be faithful with what we have? And, and how we live out the reality of, of the things that God has given to us and bestowed upon us. And, and, and what we know when we read through the parables, especially the wheat and the weeds and even this, is that there's a reality that awaits all of us. We are all going to die. And in the reality that waits is that those are, that are in Christ, those that are Christ followers, spend eternity with him. And those that are not spend eternity detached from him, not with him. And so uh, th this is what's going to happen. And in the meantime, there's this spiritual battle for souls. The, 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 the good seed and the bad seed, the, the, there's this, they're all vying for the nutrients of the ground. There's a battle, right? There's this spiritual battle that's taking place uh, in our lives. So the, the big picture of this particular parable this morning, the parable of the talents, is uh, a reminder that we have to diligently keep um, alert. We have to diligently keep working while we await the return of Christ. Uh, sort of don't fall asleep at the wheel, which is very easy for us to do, isn't it? It's easy for us to go through life and 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 have our you know our faith as sort of a part of our life, but not the center of our life. It's very easy for us in a culture that's relatively easy for us. There's not a great deal of persecution in comparison to what goes on around the world, and it's easy for us to sort of just fall asleep at the wheel. And this parable reminds us that we can't fall asleep at the wheel. That we have to be diligent and we have to continue to, uh, to, to faithfully work to bring about the kingdom of God. To faithfully work in, 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 uh, in what God's called us to do. That God has given all of us gifts. He's given us you know, resources. He's given us opportunities. He's given us uh, you know, places of influence perhaps. And all those things are given to us so that we can see the kingdom of God flourish in this world. Faithfulness is demonstrated through action and, and wise stewardship. And Jesus warns us against wasting um, all that he's entrusted to us. Um, you know, um, when, you, when you're, for example, you have a spouse or someone that you love and you say to them, I love you. Well, how do they know that you love them? They know that you love them because it's not just the words that you say, it's the actions that display what is going on in your heart. Your actions should show that you love your spouse, for example, or you love a family member, right? Love is more than just words. And, and what we learn in this parable is that being a Christ follower is more than just words. You can read in, in 1 John 3.18, it says, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So words are not enough. Words need to lead to action. Love, faithfulness leads to action. And so we've been entrusted with these things in this life. And God says, now you need to be faithful with all that I've entrusted you. So Jesus just didn't say, for example, that he loved us, did he? No, he didn't just say, I love you. He was the ultimate example of love and what he uh, did for us. Now, when we talk about the kingdom of God, there can be some confusion. 
But what do we mean when we say the kingdom of God? What exactly is the kingdom of God? And sometimes we describe the kingdom of God as this, uh, we'll say the kingdom of God is, we live in the kingdom of God, which is this already not yet reality. But what does that mean exactly? Let me just take a few minutes to, to clarify this for us because it's important for us to understand this. So we need to understand what the kingdom of God means. This is really important because these parables and many of Jesus' parables and his teaching is about the kingdom of God. He'll often say the kingdom of God. We need to understand that there is a kingdom of God and there is a kingdom of the world. And, and in, in um, th this particular doctrine is called a two kingdom doctrine, that there's the kingdom of of God and there's the kingdom of the world. I was trying to think what's, you know, what's a good way to, to help us kind of wrap our heads around this. It, most of you, I would imagine, have at least read or seen The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Narnia series. So if you're, if you're unfamiliar with that, you should watch that. But in this story, there's these two overlapping realms, okay? You have uh, the world of Narnia, and in Narnia, Aslan, who, who, is, who is God in the story, Aslan reigns and and then you have the human world where the kids come from. And, and they, 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 uh, each realm, the human world and, and Narnia, all have, uh, they, they, they each have their own rules. There's, there's authority. There's responsibilities. They're not the same. There's differences about both of these realms. Yet both realms, Narnia and the world, are under Aslan's uh, authority, his ultimate sovereignty. Okay, so the children enter the realm of Aslan, uh, the Nar in, they enter into Narnia. Do you remember how they entered into Narnia? Through the, through the wardrobe, right? They, they entered. So they, they, uh, they enter into this, this alternate realm. And that's, the, so when you, when you think about this, this, this dual citizenship, kind of, kind of keep that in your mind. So this two kingdom doctrine, uh, as Christians, we live in two realms. We live in the realm of this world, where we exist amongst the weeds, we're, but we're also citizens of God's kingdom um, as Jesus's children. So we're citizens of the kingdom of God and we're citizens of this world. And God's called us to be ambassadors in the world, to take the things of God and to, to, uh, to portray, to live out faithful lives in the world that God's placed us to contribute to the world in that way. So the church is the a spiritual kingdom and then society is this earthly kingdom. And, and we, we exist together. We cohabitate together in this world. So there's this, this idea that there's two realms. Now, God, of course, is sovereign over both. The, the earthly kingdom and the heavenly kingdom. But we exist in this life as ambassadors. We are, not, we, we are exiles. The Bible talks about we are exiles. So exiles means we're, we're placed in another place. Ambassadors is a good way to understand that as well. The Bible describes us as ambassadors. So we represent another kingdom, even though we're in this earthly kingdom. Now, the not yet means that although Jesus, um, Jesus has defeated sin and death, evil still exists in the world, right? The wheat and the tares or the wheat and the weeds tells us that that in this world, we still face sin, we still face suffering, we still face opposition. And the kingdom will be fully realized only when Jesus returns and he separates the wheat from the weeds. So he's going he's to judge the world, he's going to remove all the evil, he's going to separate the wheat from the, um, the weeds. In, Re in Revelation 21, it says he's going to establish a new heaven and an er a new earth where his reign will be fully visible and perfect. So that's what we what we. Uh, pray for when we pray your kingdom come in the Lord's prayer. That's what we're praying. Your kingdom come God. We want the fulfillment of your kingdom. So in this not yet sense, that's why we pray your kingdom come because it's not, it's not fully here. So, um, so when we understand this, this dual kingdom um, doctrine, it encourages us to live with hope and purpose. God has placed us here for a purpose and we live in the world, as broken as it may be, with the hope that Jesus is coming again. So we're called into this world to, uh, to work for justice, uh, to share the gospel, to live out kingdom values, to display to the watching world around us the kingdom that we're actually from, God's kingdom. So God is actively working through us and through his church. So we recognize that we live in a broken world. 
And our hope is set on Jesus' return when God promises uh, it will be fully complete. So, now one of the realities that this parable teaches us is this. It's not just starting the Christian life that counts. That's important, but finishing well is what what counts. There's this, starting is, is, is important, but we also need to finish. We need to persevere in the Christian life. Every one of us has started something and not finished it. We all know what that's like. You have home projects, you've started, you haven't finished. Um, and, and we understand what that's like. So it's one of the reasons why so many of us are so familiar with the first few chapters of Genesis. Right? Because with every new year, we start a new Bible reading plan. And we get so far in Genesis, and then life, you know, happens, and then you kind of, you know, maybe that's diligent, and all of a sudden, you know, you're way behind, and you just feel like throwing up your arms and saying, I'm done. All right? So we all know what it's like to start something and to not finish it. Now let's, let's jump into this together uh, and, and read what this says. For it, will be, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Now, surely when I look around this room, I look at all kinds of very talented people. You all have so many different gifts. It's amazing how the body of Christ sort of works together, united, you know, because we all have these these talents. We contribute using our talents to create a healthy, functioning body, a healthy, functioning church. In the Bible, this is not what a talent means. Right? No, we don't, the word is a bit confusing. So the, in the Bible, when he's talking about in this parable talents, it's not your, your talent. You have a talent for whatever It's not talking about that. In the Bible, talent has nothing to do with human ability. Okay, in the Bible, a talent is a is a um, a measurement for a unit of money. That's what a talent is. So it's so a talent weighed about seventy five pounds. So you could um, it was like a value for money. So you might say like, uh, can I get a talent of silver or talent of gold? So basically, can I get 75 pounds of gold, can I get 75 pounds of silver? So it's a, it's a, um, a measurement of a unit of money. That's what a talent is in the Bible. So um, one talent is essentially, think about how much money this is, it's how it makes this, this parable become very real, okay? One talent is about 20 years wages for a person in that day, one talent. Okay, so one commentator describes a talent like bags of gold. So in the parable, each servant was given a different amount. The amount that was given was not up to the servant. The amount that was given was up to the master who, who gave the talents. It wasn't up to the servant. It was up to the master. Each of the servant was not responsible for how much they got. They were responsible to steward and invest and to be faithful with whatever they received from the owner while the owner was away. Let's continue in verse 16. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. So the one who had received five talents and the one who had received two talents, uh, the amounts, of course, up to the master, to how he distributed those talents, um, the amounts given to them were doubled when the owner returned. And when the master returned and he saw how faithful he was with what he had given them, he said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now remember, it wasn't the amounts that mattered. It was the faithfulness of the servants, regardless of the amount that was praised by the master. So one started with more, but one started with less. But both of them 
were praised by the master the same. Each, each one was, was told, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. Each one gets, gets, uh, is, is equally trusted and in, in had the opportunity, uh, even though the amounts were very different. Now, the third servant was very different. The third servant was given one talent, and he took that money, and he buried it. And this is what happened. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. He gave it back to them. Now think for a moment, because I want you to see this. Now, on the surface, had the servant done anything wrong? Okay. Did he steal from the master? No. He didn't blow the money on foolish things. What he did was he gave back to the master what was given. That doesn't sound unreasonable. It doesn't sound unreasonable. If I went on vacation and I lent you my car, I would return with the expectation that I would get the car in the exact same way that I lent it to you. If I got the car back with a bumper missing or a door falling off, there's, that's, that's a problem. I, if, I also didn't have the expectation if I lent you my car that, that, that I would give you my car and then I'd get back and all of a sudden I'd get a Land Rover out of it. There's, there's, there's nothing unreasonable about what this servant did. The master gave him something and then what did the servant do? He gave that back to the master. And yet, when we hear this parable, what we read is that the servant is condemned. So we have to ask, why? Why? Well, listen to what the master says. Verse 26. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has will, be, will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Not what you might expect. What was the master so upset about? Listen, the master condemned the servant for not what the servant did, but what the servant didn't do. The servant was called wicked. It seems a bit extreme. It seems a bit extreme. Now here's what we need to understand about this parable. See, we expect the master to be upset with the servant for doing something wrong, right? Maybe spending the money foolishly, something that, you know, was forbidden by the master, an, an active sin against the master, you know, just blowing the money on stupid and foolish things. It's what we would call sins of commission, okay? Th sins uh, is, is taking the talent and fooling it and spending it foolishly. Uh, it's the sins of commission is doing things that we know we ought not to do. That's what sins of commission are. The issue was with this servant was that he didn't do something God expected him to do. That was the issue. Right? He condemned him not for what he did, but for what he didn't do. This is called a sin of omission. You have sins of commission, you have sins of omission. Right? This is not doing something that you should do. And so the, the, the action that they're to take, there's maybe oversight or indifference or willful neglect. Listen to what uh, James 4.17, it captures the essence of the sins of omission. It says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So when there is a right thing to do and you fail to do it, or you say, I'm not going to do that, that's a sin of omission. Most of us are familiar with sins of commission, things that we know we shouldn't do and yet we do. So the servant, the servant had taken this money and the servant had buried his talent and he had committed a sin of omission. 
by failing to invest all that the master had entrusted to him. So the master condemned the servant not for what he did, he condemned the servant for what he didn't do. This is important for us to understand. There was an expectation that the servant was going to use the talents that had been given for the, for, for the, um, for the betterment of the master. So Jesus is the master, and Jesus has entrusted to you and me, to us, some of the most precious and valuable commodities we have to guard and to manage well. That's what stewardship is. is. Stewardship is managing all that God's given us. Um, a good way to understand uh, owners versus managers or, or stewards is an owner takes all the things that God's given us and closes our hand around it. This is mine. But a steward says, all the things that God's given me, uh, they, they, they come into my hands so that they can go out for, for, the, for the sake of the kingdom of God. So God has entrusted all kinds of things for us to steward for the sake of his glory and for his kingdom. He's entrusted to us things like money. He's entrusted to us, you know, our possessions, our homes, our positions of authority, or positions of influence, um, abilities, different kinds of things that we are called to steward for the glory of God and for the sake of God's kingdom. Jesus, the master, owns everything. It's all his to begin with. And he gives to us, his servants, you and me, he gives us these things that we are to manage. We are to manage. And there's an ex expectation that we are to manage those things for the glory and to the glory of God. Now, you, you read that one of the, the driving factors for why the, the servant buried the talent in the ground was his fear. Fear of failure. Right? He was afraid of losing it. What if things end up going bad and, and the master comes back and there's nothing to give him? So a view of failure discourages action and we become more concerned with avoiding loss than achieving gain. So to be obedient is to risk what you have for the kingdom of God. To be obedient is to risk what you have for the kingdom of God. If, if fear, as you know, can paralyze you from action, You've probably experienced that. And not only fear can, can paralyze you, but comfort can paralyze you to action. You say, oh, I'm too comfortable. I, I can't, I don't want to risk that. Because if I risk that, I, I, it might impact my comfort. I, I don't want to risk that because I have fear. Right? So think about, think about you individually. Think about us as a church. What are we willing to risk for the kingdom of God? What are we willing to, to risk for the kingdom of God? Your money, your comfort, your friends, maybe your family. Whoa, slow down here. Slow down here. Are you saying that risking, risking it all for God is in the Bible? Do you see anywhere in Scripture where people risked it all for God? Is there anywhere in there that people risked it all for God? I mean, you can just do a cursory read over the Bible, and you can see that throughout the Bible, almost most believers were called to take a risk for the kingdom of God. And we read that, and we say, well, well isn't that so great for them? It's just not for us. We don't really have to risk like that. That's a, that's a lot to ask. I mean, think of Abraham who took the risk of leaving his homeland and, and his family, and he goes to this place that God promised him. He didn't know where he was going. And later he risked everything by being willing to sacrifice his son, Isaac, in his obedience to God. Right? Now that's, that's way at the beginning. Think of Moses when we talked about Exodus. Did Moses risk anything for God? Absolutely he did. He risked his life standing before Pharaoh and saying, you know, uh, let my people go. He risked it all. And despite his fears, he was obedient in the face of risk. And, and, and there were times where, you know, when we read the story of Moses, where that fear of risking it all for God's kingdom was debilitating for him. And there's times he's like, God, I, I can't do it. And he's right. He can't do it. But God can through him. What about Ruth, who, who took a, a 
bold risk by leaving her homeland, Moab, to follow her mother-in-law, Naomi, to Israel, a land that was foreign to her and to serve, a, to serve the God of Israel. Her loyalty and faith placed her, Ruth, in God's lineage, and she became an ancestor of King David and ultimately of Jesus. Or think of Esther, the story of Esther. She risked her life to approach King Xerxes without an invitation, and she pleaded for the survival of her people. Did she risk anything doing that? Absolutely she did. And she famously declared, if I perish, I perish. Whoa. If I perish, I perish. See, there was a willingness in Esther's life to, to risk everything for God's people. Think of David, right? This young shepherd who stands before this giant, Goliath. Did, did he, was he risking anything doing that? Absolutely he was. He did that for the honor of God's name and for the protection of Israel. And his courage came from his confidence in God's power rather than in the confidence of his own strength. But what about Daniel? You know, Daniel in the lion's den, you've seen the flannel graph. Did Daniel risk anything? Absolutely he did. He risked it all. He, he was not going to be obedient to the king, and he continued to pray to, to God even after there was a law that was passed forbidding it. He risked it all. He didn't compromise worshiping God. He risked it. What about, think just Mary, Jesus' mother. Did she risk anything? Oh man, she risked a tremendous amount of personal risk in her own life, this, society, this, this social risk that she took. It's, she's an unmarried young woman she faced the shame and rejection, but she willingly obeyed. She actually said, let it be to me according to your word. Wow. Now Peter, he boldly is preaching and boldly proclaiming in the New Testament the good news of Jesus, even after he had been imprisoned and warned of imprisonment by the religious leaders, he risked his life for the kingdom of God for the sake of spreading the good news of Jesus to the early church. What about Paul? We all know uh, Paul's story. Paul uh, endured hardships. He endured shipwrecks. He endured, he endured beatings and in, imprisonment. He left his former life, a life of great comfort, a life of great prestige and honor. And he left that and he became a missionary in this, this uh, small, fledgling little church when the first church first started, even knowing that doing so would require intense persecution. See, these individuals and so many more as we read through Scripture teach us that it's worth risking for God's kingdom. And that means trusting Him over our own security. It means trusting Him over our own reputation and our own comfort. And, and, and God uses and He honors that faith-driven risk to accomplish His purposes in the world. John Piper once said this. He said, the Christian life is a call to risk. You either live with risk or waste your life. Wow. See, the servant in this parable understood that risking is dangerous. But what we learn from this is, is that not risking is more dangerous. Obedience always involves risk. Now, here's your choices, friends. Think about this. Obedience and risk or disobedience with the illusion of safety and the guaranteed anger of God. Some of you, in a, a very practical way, have the abilities and the opportunities to be used by God in different ways, but you don't want to take the risk, whatever that risk may be. You don't want to put yourself out there. You'd rather feel in control. Obedience always involves risk. Obedience always involves risk. If, if you have a pen, you're one, you're one of those, maybe you're one of those people that have lots of different colors for your Bible. You know, write this in the front cover of your Bible. Obedience involves risk. What are the risks that God may be calling you to? What is God... 
what is God pressing upon your heart to step out into? What, what is God pressing upon your heart to say to someone? What is God pressing on your heart to do in your workplace? What is God pressing on your heart to, to do and to step up within the body of Christ? And, and, and alternately, we need to think about what are the risks that God is calling us to as a church? Corporately. See, we don't want to risk for God's kingdom because so often we're afraid. The servant himself said, I was afraid. I was afraid. And that was his reason for doing nothing. There's an Irish proverb. It says, you cannot plow the field by turning it over in your mind. You cannot plow the field by turning it over in your mind. D.L. Moody once said, if, if God be your partner, make large plans. Make large plans. Maybe in our own lives, the plans that we've made are so small that they just require no risk at all. Maybe even as a church, corporately, we, we've gotten to a place where we think to ourselves, you know, it's, it's just not worth the risk. Well, listen to what Paul says in Romans 8 as to why he was willing, amongst so many, was willing to take great risks for the kingdom of God. Here's what he says. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean when he says, give us all things, as, as, as some people may think, and some people might preach, you know, that God wants you to have a BMW. Uh, th 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 that doesn't necessarily mean that God will give you everything we want, but rather everything we truly need to, need, need to fulfill his purposes for us. Okay? Verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, or risk, or risk, or comfort, what will separate us? Nothing. What are the risks that God is calling you to? What is the fear that's preventing you from stepping out in obedience? See, we have nothing to fear. That's the point here. Verse 37. No, we have nothing to fear in all these things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what that means? It means death doesn't matter. Now here's what I know. Jesus didn't die so we can have a safe, sanitized little church community. A holy huddle that has no impact or little impact on the world around us. This is what I know. See, the Bible tells us that the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. Do, do you see that? Compass Church. We should reflect that truth. Consider this question. Is what you're doing with your life worthy of the price paid for it? Is what you're doing with your life worthy of the price paid for it? Are you going to get to heaven and feel like, what, did I, what I did with my life was worth the price that he paid? Is what you're living for worth Jesus dying for You know, I, I heard uh, a pastor say this on, uh, on, a, on a little YouTube clip, and he said, I have sat at the bedside of thousands, perhaps thousands of different people 
throughout the years who are on their deathbed. And he said, there's never been one of them that said, bring me all my trophies and achievements. Not one. He said what they wanted was people around them that loved them. Is what you're doing with your life worthy of the price paid for? See, what compels us to take risks for God's kingdom is our faith in our loving God who has good plans for us and he promises that nothing, nothing, friends, will separate us from his love. This is the very practical element to this parable. There's this very practical reality that God has given us all these places of influence and authority and money and possessions and all these things. And we need to ask, honestly, what are we doing with those things? What risks are we taking for the kingdom of God? But there's much more to this parable than meets the eye. If this parable is just about the practical, it's just about your influence, or it's just about your money, or it's just about your possessions, then we encounter a problem, don't we, when we reach verse 30. In verse 30, Jesus concludes by saying to the last servant that the last servant requires or receives eternal punishment. Verse 30, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if you just look at this parable for its practical aspect, you're going to miss the eternal significance brought out by Jesus in verse 30. The parable's implications are not just practical. The implications of this parable are eternal. Now, let me ask you this. What's the most valuable thing that Jesus has left us with that we're to cherish and to duplicate? Think about that. Was it money? Was it our family? Was it our car? Was it our house? Our whatever? No. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus for the salvation of souls for whoever believes. it's, It's this that carries the eternal weight of this parable. See, like the talents that were were duplicated and the faithful servants that did them, the gospel's to be duplicated as we share the good news that we've received to a dying world that desperately needs to hear the hope and the promises of God that's only found in him. See, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. God has entrusted to us the good news of salvation. He has given us the gospel and he has said when he left this earth, take this to the ends of the world. We have been entrusted with the gospel like the servants were entrusted with the talents. In 2 Corinthians uh, 4, the gospel is described as this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We steward the gospel not to to shine a light on us, to shine a light on on the God to whose kingdom we belong. So our master, Jesus, has given us this treasure, and he has given us and entrusted us with the good news, and he instructs us to preach that good news of him crucified, to a world that needs to hear it. And when he returns, he will give an account for what we've done with all that Jesus has asked us to do. That might make some of us a bit nervous. The servant who had the one talent had rejected the treasure and he had given back what was given. Jesus has given us the gospel and what do we do? We bury it and we say, I'm good. I'm good. Jesus says, no, you're not. Because you didn't do what I called you to do. The only explanation as to why the guy with the one talent was judged and ultimately sentenced to hell is because he didn't 
cherish what he'd been given. He didn't duplicate it like, he, like the first two servants had. We need to be faithful with the talents God has given us, not just the practical things, things like the money and possessions and abilities. We need to understand that this parable, more importantly, is about the eternal. How are we stewarding the gospel? Are we taking risks for the kingdom of God and proclaiming the good news to a world that needs to hear it? You and I are not about our business. We are about our Father's business. Wherever and whoever that may take you to. Just think about your own sphere of influence. That, that position, that place that God's called you to. What he's given you and, and how you use that influence. How are you using that influence for the sake of God's kingdom? It's not a matter of quantity. It's a matter of faithfulness. God is calling us. He's calling you and he's calling me. And we need to be faithful to the gospel. This treasure that's been entrusted to us so that others may come to that saving faith in Jesus. And when the master returns, there's this amazing return that happens. It's a gift that God allows us to be part of of his plan of salvation in the world. And he allows us to enter into that. But too often we bury it. And we bury it under the guise of comfort. And we bury it under the guise of fear. We bury it under the guise of all kinds of things. And God will return. And he will say, what have you done with what I have given you to steward? The life you live right now Right? The everyday grind of life. And I get it. Life is hard. There's a struggle. The struggle of, of what life often can be needs to be lived through the lens and with the hope that every single one of us, because this will happen, we will stand before our maker and, and Jesus will say that to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Or will you stand before your maker and he will say, you wicked and slothful servant, you buried the good news of Jesus. You didn't take it to anyone. You were so caught up in your own comfort. You had all these gifts and all, these money, all this money and all these possessions. And what did you do with it? Nothing. Nothing. I don't know about you, but, but I want to stand before God and I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Obedience involves risk. Obedience involves risk. Let me pray. Father, oh God, may this parable this morning stir our hearts. May it stir our hearts to recognize how easy it is to take for granted what we've been given and what we've been asked to steward. So I pray this morning, Lord, that as we go from here, we'll actually do the hard work of asking the questions in our life. What is preventing me from taking risks? What, what is preventing me from obedience and faithfulness in my life? What are the things that get in the way? Maybe it's comfort and maybe it's uh, fear, whatever it may be, Lord. I pray that you will help us to dismantle those things that, that sit on the throne of our heart and put you back on that rightful place. And to understand that you've called us to something more. That this, this, this world is not our home. And we are ambassadors, so we have to ask, how are we doing with that? I pray, Lord, that you make us faithful. I pray as a church, Lord, to come to this church, that, that, that you would help us, Lord, to take risks for the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord, not to be comfortable and not to be safe and not to, to go down that road in which we see so many churches go down. But Lord, may we recognize that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And may that reality push us forward to risk it all for the kingdom of God. May that be our heart this morning. And every one of us, Lord, I know we want to leave here. And one day we're going to stand before you. And we want you to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Teach us this morning, I pray, Lord, in your name. Amen.